Hi everyone, thank you so much for joining us today for a panel discussion on wildlife SOS study on the Himalayan brown bear population in Kashmir. So very little is known about the Himalayan brown bear due to its restricted distribution in the alpine meadows of the Himalayas. There is almost no research on these bears in the Kashmir region. The Himalayan brown bear population has been steadily declining in the past century with only 500 to 750 bears in India. They're listed as critically endangered on the IUCN Red List, and they face many threats, such as habitat destruction due to various anthropogenic pressures, such as habitat encroachment, tourism, and grazing pressure. To help conserve these unique bear species in Kashmir, Wildlife SOS, authorized by the Jammu and Kashmir Wildlife Protection Department, conducted a Himalayan brown bear survey for a period of six months from May to October 2021. The official report was recently published, and today we have with us the team that made this study possible. So before we begin the panel, I'll just introduce all of our panelists. We have Dr. Shabir Meer, Animal Husbandry Department, Kashmir. We have Mr. Swami Nathan S., Senior Biologist from Wildlife SOS. We have Ms. Alia Meer, Project Manager from the Wildlife SOS Conservation Program in Jammu and Kashmir and Mr. Thomas Sharp, Director of Conservation and Research at Wildlife SOS and co-chair of the IUCN SSE Sloth Bear Expert Team. Thank you for all the panelists for joining us today. As we proceed with the panel, the audience can also send us in their questions, which we'll try and answer in the uh, Q&A section of the webinar. So my first question is for Swami, sir. Uh, the most riveting finding of the study was that 75% of a brown bear's diet consists of garbage. Can you tell us a little about how this discovery was made? Yeah. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Uh, uh, thanks to this uh, good opportunity to meet everybody and uh, we'll share our work experience and uh, uh, regarding the brown bears. Uh, and I, my special thanks to Alia Madam and Shabir sir. Uh, you know, this is the one year as we got the chance to, uh, Alia Madam presented, a lot of conflict had started like that, she is talking. Afterwards, we simply started this work. Today, we reached uh, almost coloring, a radio coloring plan we reached. That's why we are, I'm very happy to reach this level uh, in the brown bear uh, research. And this is a project, we got a permission from uh, JK Forest Department. We wanted to thanks to uh, regional CCF especially. Uh, and uh, he is the one supporting very much for uh, this uh, uh, brown bear project. And uh, the project we started in the last May 2021, uh, we reached in a zone mark area. I thought it is very difficult to uh, see the brown bear in and different landscape. You know, earlier I worked in a, a completely different landscape. And this is the first time I entered the Himalayas and uh, the Trans-Himalayan region. And I'm uh, uh, really shocked. Uh, the same day I saw brown bear in the garbage, garbage sites. I and Alia Madam sitting very close to garbage area and we didn't switch off the torchlight. And all of a sudden we saw, it is a very close, some sound we heard. We switch on into the one bear standing very close to almost a five to 10 meter. Uh, that's why I shot in the brown bear is very close. Next day we went regularly, we are following and uh, and the project started in the properly in the July 21 to October. The four month work, we completed the report and we got the nice data. And uh, especially the uh, poor thing, it is the animals are in the garbage sites. And that is the very poor thing. Uh, I never seen uh, one or two places in uh, Karnataka, there is a one place the uh, sloth bear uh, coming to uh, garbage, uh, garbage bin. And the elephants also in Tamil Nadu, there were one place it's coming to garbage. But we are trying to, to stop the, uh, those kind of activities. But here I saw the first day, I saw almost three or four animals. Second day, we saw 10 to 11 animals. The same situation, it is happening in the five different sites. One is in uh, SDA sites in Sonmark. Uh, that is the uh, common site uh, for the garbage sites. It's a government uh, thing. And another 
two areas we saw, we put a camera trap also in that area. It is in that army camp. There's a two different army camp. It is a open the, it's a digging the fence underneath, it's entering inside the uh, army camp inside. It's coming for the food, the waste food. And another thing, there is a Amarnath, that area also. We are regularly visiting and we saw almost 10 to 11 bears in the same day we sighted. I think Dr. Arun also joined in that trip. Uh, we saw very close. It's coming to uh, our, we stayed in a tent and very close to that area it is reached. That's why uh, there is no fear, nothing. Almost the, we enjoyed the people. The people are telling last six, seven years, it's like habituated. Like that, I, I think that is a 10 to 15 years, like habituated, the, gen, the second generation, there's a, a bears are coming again and again, the same place. I think they are thinking it's a regular, uh, they are feeding site like that. And uh, in our observation on the feeding site area, every day, eight o'clock, eight o'clock, exactly eight o'clock, it will reach one by one, one by one, uh, almost eight, eight to 8.45, all the animals will reach. And we observed a male with two cubs, a little limping male. And that is a very huge male. And mother with two cubs, mother with single cubs, uh, and another two subadult animals. Like that, we regularly we are recording in that place. The almost 10 to uh, 8 to uh, 12 or 1 o'clock, our observation that is in the garbage sites. After the uh, food, it is eaten by the bears and the scats. Uh, it is a dropping scat, it's available. Uh, that we'll collect it. It is a wet scat, we'll collect it and we'll dry it. That is our regular uh, techniques we are using in the wildlife, uh, in the scat collections. In the carnivores and the omnivores, mm -hmm. we'll collect the scats and uh, whatever the food species is seaweed, afterwards we'll remove the uh, hairs and the seeds and all those things, we'll separate it and we'll segregate, we'll put the percentage like that. Uh, uh, scats. Almost we got the 408 scats, uh, 480 scats. In that almost 75% uh, of the garbage food items. You know, these animals are regularly coming. And another observation, a very interesting observation, the April and the starting May, uh, we got a lot of wild air. And end of the October, we got that lot of things. In between, there is a lot of food availability and there a lot of competition also. In that, not only bats, it's the eating horse, dogs, uh, jackal beside them. And, uh, 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 and uh, Amarnath area, we saw uh, marmots coming and uh, uh, I, these, those animals in Amarnath area. There's no fear, nothing, but uh, even though it is a very shy animal, but easy to see the Amarnath area, those animals. And that kind of analysis, we did a lot of uh, observations in that uh, feeding area. And uh, most of the that feeding uh, garbage dumps, it's not like a uh, not a running, it is not a maintaining. The wet, wet and dry waste together, all the plastics together, and the people are throwing uh, the butter peppers uh, and all the plastic with the food items they're throwing. And most of the scats, almost the 480 scats we recorded, almost 85 scats. That's why we little shock. Uh, we got almost uh, this many samples, but this many percentages of uh, uh, food items in the 75 percent to the garbage items and. 16% is the wild uh, plant items. Why other end? Why the animals are coming to garbage sites? One is the easily available food. It is like a fast food. These animals are getting very tasty and high nutritious. And apart from that, uh, that's the other area. We went inside the forest area and the alpine grasslands. We saw so many glaciers we found. Almost we did once uh, first we met uh, different flocks, 101 different flocks. Almost 25,000 surfers. Uh, sheep and goats are we saw in that uh, field area. Heavy grazing level people are available. I thought there is a inside uh, Am Amarnath, there is a one place it's called uh, uh, Pine Therni. Pine Therni. That place, it's an interesting place inside. I went, I stayed uh, and I saw the one glacier. It's a beautiful glacier. I wanted to reach that area. I went in there. I saw one hut. The people are in that glacier down. The people are staying. And I did a lot of, a lot of data, uh, not only brown bear, uh, snow leopard data also I got it. On the way I returned back, I saw the snow leopard footprint. Luckily, I didn't see the snow leopard footprint. Uh, luckily, I got uh, that, that's why I'm very happy I saw the snow leopard footprint. And this year, the people got the snow leopard uh, 
uh, footages also. Yeah, and uh, density we wanted to know. But uh, we know that all the five garbage sites, how many animals are reaching. Every day we are following. Every day we know the animal, some identification we know. And that, like that, we identified, we segregated that animal. At the same time, we observed in Amarnath. Amarnath also love an animal. And the army camp and different animal. The same time we got all the cameras we are getting. Almost we got the 25 different animals we got based on our records, the camera trap records. Apart from that, we did, a, that's why we put a five into five kilometer grid and we put, a, we placed the camera, cameras in that. In that, we, uh, 27 grid we made, 26 grids we made, but uh, places we got the camera traps. We got the camera traps we fixed. And in that, we got a five different places only we got a brown bear. Apart from that, we got a Nelgri Martin and all those things, all those things. And in the uh, uh, 1.5 annual per uh, kilometer square, we got the result. And apart from that, uh, we are regularly doing uh, uh, this thing, uh, science survey. Science survey we did. In that also, we got a uh, 0 0.02 annual per uh, kilometer science. We got it. That. Both the record we got, a, uh, almost we got a good result in that four months data. But in that, we cannot consider, but we need to regular monitoring. It is a very important for the censusing the animals. Every year we need to follow, every year we need to put a camera traps and we need to regular data extraction. Otherwise, we cannot talk all the uh, methodology properly. And anyway, we got that this year, uh, we are planning to do radio coloring in the coming uh, April, we are planning all those things. Apart from that, we put a questionnaire survey, we got a, uh, uh, nice uh, this thing, uh, excellent data we got based on the people's version and the department's data and uh, and the shopkeepers and the forest department staffs and everybody is uh, this thing. We got the distribution maps of uh, distribution of sloth, uh, not sloth, brown bears. Uh, in that also we made it in the uh, map we got that uh, that is a trans Himalayan region. It's a very very clear cut. It's showing the black and brown uh, 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 distribution. It is a very clear uh, the altitude wise. It's just showing and the snow leopard also. It's a very clearly it's showing the altitude wise different uh, distribution. Uh, that's why we made it a report. A report everything we showed everything. And especially the garbage bins, uh, I think this year we are, we got some records, but uh, we the same animals are for coming. I am keep on touch with the garbage uh, uh, people and uh, Alia Madam and Shabir sir also visited two, three times. And my assistant uh, Omar also visited two, three times, and they are giving uh, data. That also, uh, we are keeping maintaining the data. And the bears are eating uh, biryani and uh, all those things. That is the uh, very interesting things. Uh, and I see we observed, we observed directly, we sat and observed Dr. Shabir sir also sat uh, almost. Uh, uh, five, six times he came, he spent the whole night along with the, that cold condition. He also sat and Alia Madam sat. And we observed the bears are eating the chicken legs, uh, eggshells, and uh, chicken waste, especially eating the time in the rice also it's going. Uh, it is the big dangerous sign for that uh, animals are reaching garbage uh, sites. That's why this year we are planning to work uh, uh, how to avoid this uh, uh, garbage sites to the brown bear entering. Uh, that's why we are putting a lot of strategies and we are working with the all other department also together we are working. And I think almost I covered the garbage uh, items, yeah. Definitely, so I think uh, everything you said would be very shocking for all of us to hear, to hear that a bear was there at sharp 8 p.m. to see how commonplace it's become. And it's also amazing to hear about the amount of work it went in to uh, prove the, um, how much of their diet is made out of garbage, 26 grids and all of that camera traffic. 
so thank you so much i think going along the same lines my next question is for alia ma'am uh, to elaborate on what swami sir said uh, why is it very sad to see these bears feasting on garbage like how will it impact their uh, survival in the long in the long run uh first of all uh hello everybody and uh, thank you for uh, giving us an opportunity to interact with all such beautiful people and giving us a chance to share our work uh which is very crucial and very critical and uh coming to your question uh see ruhi uh brown bear is uh, you know one of the two apex predators of this landscape and these top predators are you know uh, the indicators of the health of these mountains of these landscapes so foraging of this top predator on garbage is it it itself uh, you know indicates that all is not well in these uh, in this eco sensitive zone so uh, it's a serious concern as you know uh, such behavior if uh, passed on to next generation of this species it could lead to change uh, in their natural behavior and it will you know uh, it will get imprinted on uh, the young cubs of uh, the species you know they will imprint that uh, this is their natural behavior of uh, feeding and eventually uh, this modification in their natural behavior can not only lead to the escalation of the human brown bear conflict which you know which itself is a serious issue and it can you know god forbid it can turn um, ugly at any point of uh, time so uh, not only that but also it will uh, have the negative impact on the health of the brown bear uh, which eventually can you know lead to the shortening of their life span because the stomach of the brown bears of this species is not designed is not made to digest such high calorie food high spicy food and you know these brown bears these bears they are susceptible to have liver ailments very you know very easily and definitely you know such um, feeding from trash it you know and that trash which is not segregated it can eventually lead to the you know it can take toll on their uh, longevity uh, so you know this issue is more serious than it than it seems and it should be dealt uh, you know at the earliest uh sharing from our study uh you know uh, from this four month study in this uh thajwas landscape in sonmarg landscape it was revealed that out of uh, like uh, you know swami sir was mentioning about it uh we did the sampling of 408 scats which were sent for you know uh, scientific sampling and we found that 86 scats uh were found to have plastic covers you know from milk packets from other things and not only that but few samples few scats were uh, you know that also showed uh small pieces and small chips of broken glass so you can very well imagine how much harm it might be doing to this species so you know we must uh, ponder on it and we must take quick actions which are recommended definitely i think it's so shocking to hear that their diet has broken glass and keeping in mind that there's already only about what uh, research says is 500 to 7 750 bears left in india it's definitely very scary to see um this happen so um, again my question is just following in on what uh, swami sir and uh, alia ma'am said for shabir sir um, what do you think is leading the brown bears to feed on garbage is it a scarcity of natural resources is it uh, anthropogenic pressure what did the study find as to why the bears are doing this Uh, hi everyone 
uh, I did spend some time with the team at Sonbach, and it was really fantastic to work with them. They worked so professionally, and they really were very well versed what they were doing. So coming to the question that what are the factors which are leading these animals to the garbage? So the answer is there are many questions. There are many factors mm -hmm. which are leading these animals to go for the garbage. As Swami said, yes, it is easily available food. It is food available in abundance. It is a tasty food, right? It is a high calorie uh, food, but we cannot deny that the lack of previous in the wild is also one of the factors which are responsible, which has brought these animals to turn towards the trash. We all know that these brown bears, they are omnivorous animals. They feed on plants and they feed on whatever animal matter they get. And here in this brown bear, we have seen that there are many wild berries, many wild fruits, grasses, and sometimes they feed on rodents like marmots, they feed on weasels, they feed on martens, and young ones of the ungulates also. So this used to be their normal food. But unfortunately, there is the lack of, uh, you know, this prey base, there's a lack of prey base in the wild, which has turned them to look towards this trash. And it's not only here, it's everywhere in the world. If you see almost everywhere in the world, the large carnivores, they are suffering because there's a lack of rabies. And it's exactly taking the toll on their health, on their behavior, and so many other things. Here also, it is doing the same. Uh, I tell you, because I'm from this place, Sunmag, it used to be closed. You know, down the uh, line, if 10 years from now, Sunmag, it used to be closed almost for five to six months because of heavy snow. And the roads, they were not motorable, they used to be closed. And probably those animals, they were going to the hibernation and there, because there was not much of disturbance and the spray base, it was thriving well in those places and all that. But now what has happened is because of this developmental act, so-called developmental activities, uh, this place, it's open. Sun mugs almost kept open throughout the winters and throughout the year. Right, these, again, uh, you know, if you see our developmental activities, especially tunneling, making of the roads, tourism, pilgrimage, this all is already in the report. This has taken the toll on the prey base. Right, leave directly it has taken the toll on the prey base, a lack of the prey base, and also, uh, because when there are a lot of people over there, they produce a lot of trash. A lot of trash has gone to the garbage bins or garbage places. And these animals, they are now turning towards these garbages. Right, that's one of the reasons that this is, and this thing is happening over there. But I can say uh, that Turning of these animals towards these garbages, it is definitely, uh, it's because of the habitat destruction of the prey base, but at the same time, it is taking, uh, their behavior is changing, their uh, feeding choices are changing. As Alia said, that will definitely have an effect on their longevity. They cannot, me being a health expert, if this thing goes on happening, because all these, what they make from the hotels and all that, it has a lot of spices, it has a lot of preservatives. And definitely that is not going to go well with those animals, right? They will have the, you know, gastric problems and all that. And definitely they will kill these animals sooner than the later. If we are not, you know, if we don't act responsibly, we have to be very responsible. We have to know our responsibilities. We have to share our duties and responsibilities. Otherwise we cannot uh, do any good to these animals. They are going to die sooner than the later. Thank you. 
Thank you so much. I think you're right. I think this is a time for our, all of us to kind of reflect on how we can contribute to um, conserving the Himalayan brown bears. Um, and I, you had said that this is happening everywhere in the world with um, a lot of species. So along those lines, Thomas, my next question is uh, for you. We've also read that bears in Yellowstone National Park, they were also found feasting on garbage. So what is the difference or similarity between that situation and the situation of brown bears in Kashmir? Um, hello, everybody. Um, yes, probably a lot of you know that actually Yellowstone National Park in the Western United States had a huge problem with garbage bears. Um, this goes back a long ways into the 50s and 60s. And actually, it's worse. Um, what we basically had in Yellowstone National Park was a big dump. And they were dumping garbage there. And it was found that all the bears were collecting there. And so what the Park Service did in the United States was, at the time, this wasn't even thought to be a negative thing. And they actually built bleachers. And if you wanted to go see a grizzly bear in the national park, you would actually go to the dump and watch the bears come in. And, and that was normal. And finally, somebody saw the light. And they saw the light largely because human bear conflicts were increasing immensely. It became a problem for the people. And finally, somebody said, you know, actually, it would probably be better for our bears to our wild bears to actually be wild. And so they went through the process of beginning to try to get these bears unfood conditioned. And this is not an easy process. And of course, when this was going on in Yellowstone National Park, um, this was somewhat new. And so the first thing they simply did was to simply close down the dumps and they buried everything. And they thought this would end the problem. And although a few bears went back to their more wild nature, it turns out that a lot of those bears were bears that weren't using the dumps that much at any rate. The hardcore trash bears, the ones who had been addicted to getting trash, simply went out and started getting into more trouble, trying to find more trash, looking for people because they knew food was associated with people. And in the end, a lot of those bears had to be removed from the population, or that's what they decided to do. And when I say removed in Yellowstone, that meant they killed a lot of bears. And we did not have a lot of bears back then. So this was a, a big deal. Um, people trying to figure out how we're going to uncondition these bears. And so eventually, um, the wild bears, as Ali has somewhat made reference to, a bear is a highly intelligent mammal that, and they do teach their young. And one of the negatives of that is that a mother bear will literally teach her young, this is how we get food. And so it's passed on to the next generation. Once this cycle is broken, and it was over time at Yellowstone National Park. So now we think, okay, all our bears are wild and that's great. And it's true, but there are still problems with food conditioning outside the parks and even in the parks where there's still a lot of work that goes on. In fact, there's a very famous brown bear in uh, the Tetons National Park next to Yellowstone. And this is Grizzly 399. I don't know if any of you have heard of it, but she actually has her own uh, Facebook page. Very popular bear because she's able to be photographed. She's actually some food conditioned which has been an issue and they keep trying to break her of the habit and she's been having a lot of cubs and some of her cubs are food conditioned. So even then the problem goes on. And I also want to mention that this isn't a problem that's unique to Kashmir or Yellowstone National Park. Almost everywhere where we have brown bears, Ursus arctos, we have potential issues with food conditioning. And this goes from Russia to um, to Greece, Italy. If you have bears near humans, it is a potential problem. If bears can get food easier, say at a trash dump, they're often likely to do that. And we need to be vigilant about trying to put an end to that. Now, in terms of the comparison between parks, Ursus arctos, the brown bear, it's the same brown bear worldwide. It has a global distribution. 
but there are different subspecies. How many subspecies depends on really who you talk to. But for the most part in Yellowstone, it's Ursus arctus horribilis, uh, which is technically, or is known as the grizzly bear. And in India, we have Ursus arctus isabellinus, which is the red bear. But it's basically the same animal. Now there are differences and certainly one difference is, and I've talked a lot to Alia and Shabir about this, which is that the bears in India seem not as aggressive. And there's videos of people chasing brown bears in a dump. And this would not go over well with, with the one we have in Yellowstone. More people would be injured because our subspecies out here is a little more aggressive, potentially more dangerous. But for the most part, we're talking about a very similar animal. It, it is the same animal, just little differences. Some of the other differences between these locations is habitat and landscape are different. I don't think that feeds too much into our problem. But the other one is, of course, what is the political situation? And all I mean by that is in Yellowstone, they were lucky, at least they had a huge expanse of land. Um, so when they're trying to stop bears from being food conditioned, the bears could at least spread out over a wider area. Um, <clears throat> there's not as much possibility of that for the red bear in India, simply because you know there are borders with Pakistan, there are borders with China. Um, so there's some, the bears are moving, um, but there's some anthropogenic differences which can affect the politics of how you deal with bears. In Yellowstone with problem bears, they used to take them and move them great distances. It didn't work very well, but the only times it did work well is if you move that bear uh, literally, you know, hundreds of miles from where it was. Otherwise, it would just go right back to where it was and start causing the same problems. Um, so I hope that kind of gives some background into the, uh, into, um, the similarities and the differences and really how this is a problem with this species overall. And again, it's not because this is a dumb animal. They're actually a smart animal. It makes sense in a lot of ways. But as Ali and Shabir talked about, I mean, a bear feeding garbage is, uh, it's, it's a problem. It's a problem for people, but it's a problem for the bear. The idea of them eating plastic and glass and all that, and even hurting their feet, you know, by walking through these dumps. I worked in Alaska on a small island where we have brown bears. And um, um, one of the big things was they would injure their feet, which is horrible because they cut it on glass or pipes or anything. So I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that. Thank you so much, Thomas. I think um, everything you said really puts into context that this is not just a problem in the region of Kashmir, but it's really a worldwide issue that we all um, really need to start paying attention to. Uh, so going forward, I'll just uh, open up the floor to the audience Q&A. We have one question from an audience member and uh, I'll just leave it up to the panelist, whoever chooses to answer. We still have Swami sir with us just because of network issues. He's had to turn his cameras off. So Swami sir, please feel free to answer as well. Uh, so the question is that the brown bear is found in the upper region upper reaches of uh, stony terrains and not jungles like the black bear. And it's almost deaf and not as aggressive according to traditional wisdom, though it is bigger than the black bear. Is this true? Yeah, it's a comparatively, it's a bigger than the, uh, this thing, brown bear is the, bigger than the black bear. That is true. Uh, but uh, uh, this thing, no, there's a uh, these bears. It is a staying in that alpine and meadows, not in that uh, uh, dense forest inside. That is a very clear cut. It's showing the uh, 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 this thing contour wise. It is it's showing the differentiate uh, very clear cut margin. It's showing black and brown. Uh, it is a because of uh, their habits, and the black is a very aggressive. Uh, comparatively, uh, brown is a, a little docile only. And uh, I saw in Dachikam National Park almost five, six bears uh, together, it's coming. Uh, almost 15 bears they saw together like that, but very aggressive. It came very close, it's very aggressive. 
but brown we are sitting in nearby garbage it is a very docile behavior is also it is a, a docile and uh, that is a apex uh, uh, omnivorous it is a staying in that uh, top of the areas only it is a very clear at the boundaries it's showing Uh, yeah, Swami, you're right. Uh, you know, normally, that's also one of the problems because normally its range starts from the 3,500 meters to 5,000 meters. These high altitude animals, they have started descending down, which in the long run is a problem. They were meant, the high altitude animals, go on the high reaches, stay there. Stay there. Uh, and comparing, as uh, Thomas said, their bears are very aggressive. The brown bears are out there. They are very aggressive. But here we have seen these brown bears. They are very docile. Uh, comparatively, they are bigger. They are much bigger uh, than the black bears, right? And their feeding and all, I won't say is, you know, uh, remarkably different, but it is a little different than this thing. It's true. Uh, again, I'm saying that this is again going to be a problem because if these brown bears, they are descending down to the low altitudes, what will happen? We will have more and more of conflicts with the people. We'll have the crop ratings. We will have the depredation of the livestock. So ideally they should be in their own, you know, uh, the range. range. It starts from 3,500 to 5,000, uh, you know, mm. meters. That would be ideal. Yeah, sir. It is. Uh, it's showing only three thousand and above only, sir. It's not coming down, but very clear in the zone mark down area. It is a very clear. It's showing the black bear. It's operating down. Uh, it is almost that uh, vulnerable close to area. It is a black bear. It's operating, and the above area. It is a brown bear. It's operating, sir. It is a very clear cut boundaries. It's not overlapping. There is no overlap. I think there's a only one time. It came to the wildlife hut in Sonmark nearby. The black bear entered, sir. Again, returned back. That is the only one record I saw in that four month period. But brown bears are not going down, sir. And its uniqueness is where it stays. Like, you know, uh, if you see the topography of the Sonmark area, the Tajiwas Wildlife Sanctuary, it is really, uh, I won't say it's a dry desert, but it is a rocky place and it is still managing to stay over there rather than going into the dense forests and all that. And I think um, if I heard the question right, there was also a question about their senses. And the, the reality is brown bears, they do see about as well as humans. They hear pretty well as well. But really their nose their, is their key way they sense the world. So these animals can smell, um, you know, at least a hundred times better than humans can. Um, so their other senses are somewhat comparable to ours, but their nose is much superior to the human nose. Uh, so we have a lot of questions coming in. So I'll just ask um, another one and we'll try and answer everyone's questions. If they don't get answered, you can uh, email us or we'll try and send you the correct um, link. Um, the other question is that are brown bears changing their hibernation pattern because of this changed feeding behavior? Yes. Uh... Uh, see, this is a two, last two years observation. Yeah, last two season observation we observed. Some of the brown bears, it's coming the entire period of the winter season also. It is in the garbage sites because of the, and they are throwing a lot of waste for this. Uh, but the, I think four or five bears regularly it's coming. Uh, uh, and my observation and Umar also, uh, my field assistant told uh, the entire winter season is entered in the garbage sites. It is not uh, uh, not at all going for the hibernation. Uh, I think male, we, male didn't come, 
that another female also didn't come but the two uh, cubs with mother uh, it is a regular every day it's coming in the whole winter season definitely it will affect the uh, the cycle and the system definitely yeah i think that what needs to be kept in mind is basically hibernation is is due to a lack of food that's why bears go into a hibernation it's not because of the cold they're fine with the cold so as long as there's a food source for them there's really except to give cubs there's no other reason to go into hibernation so as, as swami was saying these bears are showing now that type of behavior where if they have food they'll they'll stay up or even if they do go into hibernation um, in other places i've noticed noticed that um, they'll just go in for a shorter time but it's definitely disrupting their natural hibernation pattern uh, further research can help us to know more about uh, their you know changing behavior so uh, definitely uh, you know uh, we can't for now we can't say that all the bears they have altered their hibernation period or they you know they completely don't go for the hibernation but yes a uh, few of uh, the reports which we get throughout the winter season from last 2 3 years they definitely indicate that uh, you know their uh, availability of the unnatural food is you know uh, getting them to change their hibernation period uh, but you know, this is my personal observation that when there was a layer of around one and a half to two feet of snow and the external temperature, it was minus 12. At that time also, brown bears, they were foraging uh, in the trash. Yeah. So that means there is drastically a change in the behavior of these brown bears. This, their habituation it is so strong now that it is not letting them to go for the hibernation. Although the temperature is very low, as well as there is snow everywhere. We have seen the bears foraging there in the trash. Um, the other question that we have is, is brown bear an umbrella or a keystone species? As citizens, what can we do to conserve or protect this particular species from getting endangered? Yes, uh, this is the keystone species, umbrella species, that is true. You know, this affects uh, omnivore, uh, carnivore, like that uh, we are considering, snow leopard and the brown bear. Uh, see, the, because of the climate change, is the one of the reason and the anthropogenic the anthropogenic pressure is the second highest pressures and other developmental activities uh, from other all other departments it is like uh, uh, in uh, especially kashmir they are having they are facing a lot of problems in the apex predators uh, because of grazing it's a grazing grazing is the overgrazing there is no regulation there is no uh, uh, a limit. The overgrazing is going on. The all uh, high uh, uh, altitude areas, all the grasslands, especially. And that is a big uh, this thing. And another thing we observed the questionnaires and uh, that uh, with uh, along with the shepherds. And we asked the, they are they are facing a lot of problems. Uh, not a brown bear issues is the one part and another problem they are facing is a zoonosis disease it is like a fmd foot and mouth disease almost we observed almost half of the population uh, half of the uh, flocks we saw foot and mouth disease uh, spreads in animal died they threw uh, uh, in the riverside and watery area and grassland sites like that, they are throwing. They don't know proper disposal also. And the FMD is the uh, big uh, dangerous for uh, that area. Other uh, ibex also, it will definitely it will spread. The hoof, all the hoofed animals, it is very dangerous for the FMD. Uh, that is the one we observed. And the overgrazing is the second one. And the third one is the developmental activities like uh, uh, tunneling and uh, the road construction works. Uh, there is a big issues is going on and 
other thing the Amarnath pilgrims. The Amarnath uh, is the big thing. Uh, it is uh, going on uh, the main. hotspots uh, area of brown bear and snow leopard area and we observed the footprints and the scats we collected from the snow leopard in that main Amarnath closer to Amarnath area and the brown bear also brown bear uh, direct sighting and uh, all the observation uh, in that uh, every day the that 56 days or 46 days the people are telling in that summer uh, time uh, it is like uh, uh, for 6000 to 7000 people every day they'll reach for the pilgrim list this is the pilgrim list i'm talking in that pilgrim 6000 to 7000 people supporting staffs it's a two two people and one on pony like that no that is a big pressure it is happening in that area uh, that is also big issues uh, facing in that uh, main uh, center uh, brown bear and uh, small upper area. It's a facing. Uh, that is the issues we reported in the in our report. We highlighted and alternative works also we highlighted recommendation, other department recommendation, other department coordination. It is very important for this. We suggested all those things. Yeah, that's why we need to protect these two animals. Automatically, all the animals, ibex, automatically it will uh, improve their habit, improve their population. Once you protect the top keystone species or umbrella species, automatically all other species and all fauna and flora automatically it will uh, survive. That is the main thing. That's why they are call it such a keystone species or umbrella. I would say that uh, you know the conservation of the brown bears yes, it cannot yes, be yes. it cannot be left to one or two departments or one or two agencies. Everybody has to come forward and share the responsibilities. Be it the developmental infrastructure developmental agencies, they will have to think to do the minimum possible damage to the habitat if they want to conserve the brown bears. Effective disposal of the garbage by the municipalities, that's also one of, that's one of the main factors. Unless they take care of that, okay, how do we expect that we can do good to this animal? Right, uh, Amarnath Shrine, uh, whatever it is, if they don't regulate the trafficking of the pilgrims beyond the carrying capacity of that landscape, Nothing can be done. Wildlife department or wildlife SOS, they can also come in. They can, you know, put their resources there. They can put the man. They can do more and more research and find out the ways and means which can help these animals. So what lastly, I mean to say that it cannot be done in isolation. Unless all the other agencies, they work together, we cannot conserve this apex, you know, predators or this species. So everybody has to give their, uh, you know, contribution. Uh, to add uh, to, you know, add something to uh, what Dr. Shabir and what Swami sir said, uh, you know, uh, we must all understand that it's this landscape, it's an area which is intrinsically lo low resilience. And it is susceptible, uh, you know, to irreparable loss with minor disturbances. Like it remains one of the threat, you know, I would be mentioning uh, is the uh, livestock grazing. This area remains under occupancy of uh, nomadic grazers who come from different districts of Jammu as well as Kashmir. And they occupy this place for at least four to five months. And they are a source of continued biotic interference and disturbances, which can be very well explained uh, from our study 
from our four month study in uh, that landscape that reveals that 83% of these grazers, they uh, and their livestock, they occupy the ranges that comes between 3000 and 4000 meters, which is the uh, prime habitat of uh, yes. these species as well as of the uh, other uh, predators and their um, you know prey base like um, ungulates like uh, mustair and goral and asiatic ibex etc so uh, we have to understand that you know uh, first another you know uh, revealing uh, um, report that uh, the livestock uh, population of this uh, goat and uh, sheep were around 25,000 uh, in 101 different flocks. And out of these 101 different uh, flocks, 77 flocks were reported to have infectious zoonotic disease. Thus, it poses a huge threat to wildlife species. You know, uh, we have to understand this is the huge threat, which we have to uh, address with the support of the animal husbandry department. Another great threat is uh, the tourist flow, the footfall of, uh, you know, uh, Sonmarg and Thajwas landscape that remains from uh, April up to, you know, uh, no, nowadays, it, nowadays it's open for all the seasons. Earlier it used to be during uh, April to uh, November, but nowadays it's uh, since the government uh, they are making the roads uh, weatherproof roads and they are making yeah, the nice. tunnels, etc. So a lot of developmental work is going on there. So this area has been thrown open uh, to tourists for all the months for all the Jeez. seasons. So we have to understand that the carrying capacity, taking you know, care of the carrying capacity of this place, we have to regulate this footfall of the tourists, which not only is uh, because of the scenic beauty of this place, because of the aesthetic value of this place, but we also have uh, you know, uh, pilgrim tourists, uh, because we have uh, the holy shrine of Amarnath in uh, this landscape. Uh, the, you know, huge footfall of the local tourists as well as the tourists from throughout the India, throughout the world, and uh, from these, uh, you know, pilgrims, they are posing a huge threat to this landscape. More tourists, more garbage and definite, definitely more problem. Uh, from last few years, uh, the government, they made the arrangement for uh, almost seven to eight lakh pilgrims during the two months. So you can imagine the rush, the footfall in that area during those peak months. But this all has to be regulated. So this needs to be regulated. Yeah, I would only add that we often talk about um, humans with bear issues, but what we're really talking about is bears who have human issues. And because humans are the ones changing the landscape, they're the ones, um, as Ali and Shabir were just talking about, they're the ones changing the landscape, so the bears are trying to adjust. One way they're adjusting is going after easy food, with the, which is trash. So again, these are bears trying to deal with human issues. We're the ones changing things so quickly, um, and the bears are just trying to adjust. Uh, so I think uh, going off our last discussion, um, I think the final question that would be apt to close the panel is, what can we do as either locals in Kashmir or tourists in Kashmir um, to contribute towards the conservation of Himalayan brown bears? Are there little steps we can take, like obviously segregating our garbage? Um, what can we do? Is there anything you would like to tell me and all of the attendees here to be mindful of? Uh, I 
Yes. Thing. Yes. Yeah, yes. Please go on. Please, please, please. Sir, sir, you proceed. Sir, sir. Yeah. I would just say one thing to, that we have to be very responsible. We have to give due respect, not only to brown bears. If we are, you know, visiting a landscape, which is a wildlife sanctuary or which is a national park, definitely we will have to do the due respect to those species who are there. So we have to act responsibility uh, with the responsibility and we have to be, uh, Really, we had to keep in the back of the mind that this place belongs to someone else. We are basically the visitors there. And this belongs to someone else, which is definitely the wildlife of that place. Swami, please go on. Yes, uh, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we need to fight, fight with the government. You know, that is a very important uh, with all the department, especially. See the, see already, you observe the Sindh Valley. It starts from uh, you you drive from Srinagar, you see the Sindh Valley. It is a Sindh Valley. It is a, like uh, she, uh, uh, Sonmark is present in that place only. Baltal is the top of the Sindh Valley. Almost uh, Zozila is the top, hilltop. Uh, you, are, you, you see that developmental human encroachment, all those things. It is a, happened almost the base of the Sonmark. So Sonmark and it crossed the Sonmark. But the, the government is planning the new development. It is a, like a township project. That is a, we need to fight with the government. We wanted to stop that township project. It is not necessary at all in that place. And I see that is the one patch almost to 10 kilometer. Uh, yeah, less than 10 kilometer. That is a patch. It is available for the animal crossing one side to another side. So that is the one place it's available. But the government is planning the center of the area. They are planning to develop the township project. It is not necessary at all. They are planning to uh, do the township. It is recreating the tourist, encouraging the tourist. Now, because of the tunnel project started, tunnel we are not denying. Tunnel it's uh, needed for the uh, protection purpose or the international borders are available. That is very important. That is we are not denying. Once the tunnel started, the habitat to the entire uh, vehicles will go inside tunnel. Entire habitats will available for the animals. That is a completely I'm agreeing. But in between the zone mark and, and that remaining part of the roads need to put a, some underneath a, a animal to cross like the, you know, there, now the roads are uh, elaborated, big roads and now they created. In that also government need to, uh, uh, some implement we wanted to do. We want to fight with the government. And that it is not necessary for that tourism, the township project. We need to completely against the uh, township project. We wanted to stop the township project in that place. We will develop in Sonmark city inside. There's no issues. We don't want it to in that uh, place. Uh, not only that, uh, through our assessment and through our study, we have identified certain stakeholders. I think almost uh, seven, eight stakeholders of that place. And as Doc Shabir mentioned, that we have to identify our roles, all the stakeholders as, you know, uh, me as a common man, as a common uh, local person, we have to understand and identify our roles, our um, responsibility. And, uh, you know, uh, I can say that, uh, that the situation is not that ugly. We still have time. We still have time to react and we still have time to react positively. And uh, we have to work all the stakeholders have to work hands uh, together and we have to work at different fronts simultaneously to address this issue. And I would uh, you know, say that further research together with strict implementation of various recommended measures, preventive measures and awareness of all the stakeholders from all the stakeholders can be consequential uh, to move forward. So we have a long way to go, uh, but we have to you know, start from somewhere. So that's all you know, I can say.
Thomas, is there anything you'd like to add to anything we can do? No, I, I think they covered it very well. Okay, great. So yeah, I just then um, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us and the special thanks to obviously Alia ma'am, Shabir sir, Thomas and Swami sir. You've been very patient with all of our questions and given us great answers. Um, so thank you so much. And for everyone whose questions weren't answered, you can email us and we'll make sure we respond to all of your queries. So yes, thank you so much all for being here. Finally, thank you, thank you everyone. Finally, I need to thanks JK Falls Department and especially special thanks to JK. JK Wildlife Protection Department. Wildlife sir. Protection Department and the special back from Thomas and Nikki. That is why we succeed in this project. Yeah. Absolutely. Just thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. All. Thank you. So Good night. Thank you. All. Thank you everyone.